All right. We're starting off the, uh, the morning with a, a very special speaker. We're deeply honored to have uh, him as our keynote speaker uh, from Air Force uh, Lieutenant General Richard Clark. Uh, Lieutenant General uh, Clark is the Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Deterrence and Nuclear Integration for the U.S. Air Force Headquarters, Arlington, Virginia. And it, it, he is the Air Force lead for con con countering weapons of mass destruction. General Clark is responsible to the Secretary and Chief of Staff of the Air Force for focus on nuclear deterrent operations. He provides direction, guidance, integration, and advocacy regarding nuclear deterrence mission of, in the, of the U.S. Air Force while engaging with joint interagency partners for nuclear for nuclear enterprise solutions. General Clark graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1986. He held, has held numerous tactical operational strategic operations, and then he went back to be the commandant of cadets for the U.S. Air Force Academy. I'm sure he knew where all the bodies were. Sir, without any further ado, Lieutenant General Richard Clark. Okay, well thank you everybody. I appreciate you being here and uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, it really is an honor uh, to be here to speak to all of you today. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with my role, I am the uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force's lead for the portfolio on all matters of strategic deterrence and uh, nuclear integration. Put another way, I guess my job is really to lead the amazing men and women who work for me to ensure that our Air Force is prepared at all times to defend the nation by deterring our adversaries from using nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons against us or our allies. Uh, and as I look out into the audience today, I'm pleased to see a room full of soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, civilians, contractors, all working towards that same goal. So it really is great to be here this morning. And I um, want to start off, you know, during the Cold War, uh, deterrence, I think, was uh, a little bit easier to grasp. Um, we lived in a bipolar world under the threat of mutually assured destruction. And both the NATO and the Warsaw Pact had large quantities of weapon uh, that could really, we could really destroy one another, and we used those weapons to deter that uh, mass destruction. But I heard a story at one point that the Americans and the Soviets decided uh, that they were on the brink of disaster and needed to try to solve the problem in a different way. So one day they sat down and they decided to settle this whole dispute with one dogfight. Now I know you're thinking, an Air Force officer, uh, I'm sure you think I'm talking about a fighter jet dogfight, but I'm not. This is a Seaburn conference, so I mean a biological dogfight. So both sides would have five years to breed the best fighting dog in the world, and whichever side's dog won would be entitled to dominate the planet. So the Russians found the biggest, meanest Doberman and Rottweiler female dogs that they could find, and they bred them with the biggest, most ferocious Siberian wolves. And after five years, they came out with this incredible, vicious dog, the most, most vicious the world has seen. It's so vicious that the cage needed five-inch steel bars. Nobody could even get near this dog. When the day came for the fight, the Americans showed up and they had a strange looking animal. It was a nine foot long dachshund. <laughs> Everyone kind of looked at him and said, oh man, America's done. America is over. Because uh, they pretty much figured that, America, that America's dog would only last about 10 seconds with this, with this ferocious Russian dog. So when the cage opened up, the dachshund kind of came out of the cage and slowly waddled over towards the Russian dog. The Russian dog snarled, showing its teeth, 
and it leapt out of the cage and charged towards the American uh, Datsun. But when it got close enough to the Datsun, the Datsun opened its mouth and ate the Russian dog in one bite. There was nothing left of the Russian dog. It was incredible. America had won. The Russians came up to the Americans afterwards, shaking their heads in disbelief. They said, we don't understand. How could this have happened? We had our best scientists, we had our best breeders working for five years with Dobermans, Rottweilers, wolves to, to breed this, this crazy animal. How could this have happened? And the Americans said, that's nothing. We worked for five years with our best plastic surgeons to change an alligator into a Datsun. <laughs> That's asymmetric warfare right there. <laughs> Unfortunately, deterrence isn't as easy as winning one dogfight. And the threat facing our nation is more multifaceted today than it ever has been, especially during the Cold War. Today we face <clears throat> an evolving and uncertain international security environment to include a renewed threat from Russia. As our 2018 National Defense Strategy notes, interstate strategic competition is now the primary concern in U.S. national security. And the return of great power competition is increasing the role of WMD and counter-WMD capabilities in the strategic environment. As leaders and partners in U.S. national security, we must recognize that the impact that great power competition has on nuclear deterrence and counter WMD mission areas is vital. As the Director of National Intelligence testified to Congress earlier this year, we expect the overall threat from WMD to continue to grow. The activities of our two primary strategic competitors, Russia and China, underscore the threat. On the nuclear front, Russia is modernizing its full range of nuclear systems and has the desire to integrate nuclear and non-nuclear capabilities. They are, in effect, blurring the lines between nuclear and conventional warfare. This is highlighted by their escalate-to-win strategy, where the use of non-strategic nuclear weapons to achieve tactical goals remains a real and deeply concerning possibility. As for China, they're pursuing entirely new nuclear capabilities. They have a stated no-use first, no first use policy, but no one's exactly sure what that means or when they might use nuclear weapons in a conflict. Russia and China are also developing the means to rapidly achieve their objectives before we and our allies can successfully intervene. They can employ advanced air defense systems to limit our access and freedom to operate, and they have the capacity to fire volleys of ballistic missiles targeting our fleets, forces, and our operating bases. In addition to Russia and China, we must also consider the threat posed by North Korea and Iran, which the National Defense Strategy describes as rogue regimes. In January, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coates testified that while North Korea has ceased nuclear missile and warhead-related tests, North Korea is assessed to be retaining their WMD capabilities because they deem them necessary for regime survival. Meanwhile, Iran continues to threaten stability in the Middle East. One of Iran's primary tools for coercion and the force projection is its growing missile arsenal, which is improving in accuracy, range, and lethality. Finally, we can't forget our ongoing fight against violent extremists who desire to obtain dangerous technologies to harm our citizens and our way of life. With respect to chemical threats, the Director of National Intelligence also called out the most significant and sustained use of chemical weapons in decades. In the past two years, North Korea, Russia, Syria, and ISIS have all used chemical weapons. These attacks have included traditional CW agents, toxic industrial chemicals, and the first known use of a fourth generation nerve agent. The threat from biological weapons has also become more diverse, and dual use technologies has only made their development easier. Bottom line, the threat is real, it's complex, and it's growing. So what is our strategy to deal with it? As I said before, 
Our nation's strategy is to deter adversaries from using weapons of mass destruction by convincing them that WMDs won't help them achieve their objectives. There's two main mechanisms to convince them of this. The first is the assurance of unacceptable consequences on the adversary if they engage in the use of WMD. One of the principal ways to impose costs is through our nuclear deterrent forces, fielded by great Americans every day. But what I'm here to discuss with you all today is the second method of deterrence of our adversaries, deterrence by denial. This is our ability to deny our adversaries the outcomes they're hoping for by taking away their potential, at their potential advantage or by reducing their probability of success. To accomplish this type of uh, deterrence, we need affordable ways to deny the benefits of our adversaries' WMD use and communicate that to them. When I said earlier that I see a room full of people helping to deter our adversaries, it is deterrence by denial that I'm speaking of. All of you are at the front lines of this strategy. In fighting on those front lines, you ensure that no adversary WMD will stop our airmen from carrying out the Air Force's five core missions, air and space superiority, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, rapid global mobility, global strike, and command and control. All five of these missions are essential in providing nuclear deterrence. They also provide critical capabilities to our sister services and the joint fight. The Air Force can deliver those capabilities because of our network of forward operating locations and stateside bases with all of the infrastructure that goes with them, maintenance facilities, runways, hangars, launch facilities, and communication nodes. While forward operating locations give us flexibility and proximity to targets, stateside bases also provide critical capabilities for strategic missions and supporting operational missions around the world. The Air Force's ability to succeed in all five of our core missions relies heavily on the infrastructure at our bases. Ideally, we'll be successful in preventing any attack from occurring at any of our bases. But should that fail, the Air Force must be ready to fight in, around, and through a contaminated environment. With that in mind, our, our counter sea burn con ops are based on understanding and managing risk of exposure over time. And when I think of our personnel engaging in the counter sea burn fight, I think of the acronym a PRO, because they are pros. A P R O. A stands for assess the threat. P, protect our personnel and infrastructure. R, restore capabilities. And O, operate to achieve our objectives. A, pro. Now let me take these one at a time. First, our CONOPS calls for us to provide commanders with rapid response hazmat sea burn teams to quickly and definitively assess any potential WMD threats or incidents. Secondly, we'll use those assessments to protect our airmen from any attack by operating on uncontaminated upwind positions of a base as much as possible. For the airmen who serve in the worst of the contaminations, we'll protect them with our highest level protection gear, Mission Oriented Protective Posture 4, or MOP 4, and use work rest cycles to avoid heat stress based on commander's discretion. Once we have protection in place, we'll restore our aircraft and conduct spot restorations on base infrastructure that will allow most of our airmen to keep focused on their primary missions. And all of this points to returning capabilities back to operations in as timely a manner as possible. And in returning to operations, we've achieved our strategy of deterrence by denial and are in a position to begin inflicting unacceptable consequences on the adversary, and if necessary, to achieve our stated objectives. Now with this CONOPS in mind, we can now start laying out the modernized capabilities that the Air Force will need to achieve that vision. A few overarching points on the modernization. First, new systems must be affordable to procure and sustain. Second, we need to be adaptable to evolving threats. Third, the pace of the traditional acquisition process is too slow in most cases. 
we have to speed it up. Fourth, experimentation and technology demonstrations are critical to understanding the benefits of new technology and developing CONOPS to employ it. And finally, the Air Force can and will adapt to take advantage of novel seabird defense technologies if the operational impact is sufficient. So when we apply this to the APRO model, I described before, A, assess, P, protect, R, restore, O, o operate, we begin to see some sea burn capabilities that we are most interested in. In the realm of assessment, we need better capabilities to detect covert releases and inbound UAVs with chemical or biological payloads. After chemical warfare attacks, we need new chemical detectors like those that the Joint Program Executive Office is developing to give commanders the tools they need to assess hazards from low-level chemical vapors and manage risks more effectively. In the future, we'll also need the ability to assess chemical agents in the parts per billion range in near real time and create decision support tools and artificial intelligence to help commanders and their staffs rapidly make the best decisions. Looking at protection, the Joint Program Office is funding very successful work to determine how well our fighter aircraft can, can clear vapors from the cockpit. This will potentially allow fighter air crew to fly most of their mission without being encumbered by a seabird mass. We hope to expand this to large frame aircraft next. When that doesn't work, our efforts on creating a new fighter mass will inform future requirements to develop operationally suitable air crew mass. More good news is that the Joint Strategic Air Crew Mass for Rotary Aircraft and the Joint Strategic Air Mass for Strategic Aircraft Systems are being fielded right now. While no one likes wearing a gas mask, our air crew have found them exponentially more favorable than the legacy masks. To protect our ground crews, we need the improvements that the Uniform Integrated Protection Ensemble, or UIPE2, ground crew equipment garment will bring. This is a much needed update that will provide better capabilities for the threats that our airmen face today. We're also very interested in active cooling systems to increase work capacity for aircraft maintainers, weapons loaders, and civil engineers. When the ground crew are off shift, airmen at a contaminated base need a safe place to rest and recover. The Air Force has two types of collective protection or cold pro for them. Fixed cold pro built into buildings and expeditionary cold pro, which is primarily tents. Currently, both options are expensive, and without more for affordable technologies, we may not be able to fully fund this capability for our airmen. Restoring capabilities is the next step. Medical countermeasures like more effective prophylaxis and, and therapeutics against non-traditional agents are a top priority. We're also interested in physiological monitoring and the colonestre uh, testing, the Air Force also recognizes the need for DOD to, to be able to rapidly develop countermeasures for emerging and engineered pathogens that may be weaponized. <laughs> to restore base infrastructure, we currently do not conduct large-scale chemical decontamination. That's because in many cases, the hazardous agent is absorbed deep into the paint, rubber, concrete, and asphalt well beyond the reach of available decontaminants. We're looking for a non-destructive decontaminants that can pull absorbed agents out of the aircraft top, uh, top coat and other paints, as well as rubber and pavement. The, biolog the Joint Biological Agent Decontamination System, JBADS, will effectively clear biological contaminated aircraft up to a C-130 in size and the associated equipment for unrestricted use. And we're also looking forward to expanding this type of, of technology to chemical decontamination. These future capabilities are just a few examples of what will lay the groundwork for helping our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines to win in any threat environment and to be a pro. Assess the threat, protect themselves, restore the mission, and operate to achieve our own objectives and deny the enemy theirs as quickly as possible. And I have all of you to thank for making those achievements possible in the work that you do every day. In today's multifaceted security environment, we rely on all our partners to help us to deter adversaries 
by convincing them that their use of weapons of mass destruction will cost them more than they will gain. Only with your continued innovation can we assure that no sea burn threat will stop the Air Force, the Department of Defense, or America from achieving its mission objectives. Thank you for taking the time to listen to me a bit today, and thank you for all that you're doing to keep our airmen, soldiers, sailors, and Marines safe and ready to accomplish their mission. And I look forward to the solutions that this industry and our government partners offer in the future. Thank you. So I think uh, I get what I was told are anonymous questions. That's not fair, but I'll give you anonymous answers. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. Um, so Mr. Bryce, uh, first I want to I want to thank you for for having me here and uh, and for all the work that you're doing. I want to say that publicly uh, for you and your team and what you guys continue to push for for our, all of our uh, our warriors out in the field. So thank you, sir. Okay, I see a question, I think. As the best defense is often a strong offense, are there plans to restore our offense chem bio weapons? Oh. <laughs> okay. So uh, those, those are plans that I am not aware of. If they are, uh, they're anonymous. So, but, but, yeah, that is that is not something that I am aware of, and uh, I, I can I can ask Mr. Bryce. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I I don't think that that's a, a direction that we're going. Again, I, I talked about deterrence. Our primary strategy really is about deterrence, and from a chem bio standpoint, it's about denial. As I discussed, it's about the enemy looking at us and saying, okay. If we go, if we decide to use chem bio weapons, what's that going to do for, for them on the world stage? What will that mean to their legitimacy as a power? And will it produce the effects that they're after? Our answer has got to be no. It is not going to produce the effects because we are able to fight in, around, and through the threat that you might lay down before us. And, and that's where we have to be. It is a deterrent strategy in this realm. And, uh, and that's what we're moving towards. So the offensive uh, uh, capabilities is not something that's a part of our strategy, but the defense is critical. The deterrent piece of this is, is what, we're, uh, what we're assuring our strategy on, what we're resting it on. So no offensive capability um, that I'm aware of. And I don't think we'll, we'll go there from my, uh, from my perspective. Okay. All right, so what is the greatest challenge for the U.S. Air Force as it pertains to sea burn defense? Funding, technology, force structure, et cetera. So uh, the answer is all of the above. We, we have uh, significant challenges ahead of us. And, and to be honest, uh, just from by the way of uh, things like air crew protection, aircraft decontamination, um, infrastructure decontamination, we have a long ways to go. We're in the middle of conducting assessments to really have a good grasp of where we need to be um, and, and what kind of lengths we have to go to at this point. But I will be honest with you, there's even issues with our, uh, we're, we're still even working through issues in our organizational structure to make sure that from the field, the needs are, are are filtered right up to the, the top levels of the Air Force. So though we realize and, and truly do understand the kind of threat that we're facing, there's a lot of challenges both organizationally uh, and financially that we have to work through to ensure that our airmen are getting the things that they need. Um, funding is definitely an issue too. And I think some of our problems, if you if you want to go back into history, stem from the fact that we've been in a whole different kind of fight for the last few decades. Um, in this counterterrorism fight that we've been in, sea burn wasn't a threat that we had to face. 
just like nuclear was. We, we weren't really thinking about nuclear uh, deterrence as much as we had in the past when the threat was, was right here, was right in front of us. So some of the uh, capabilities, some of the thought, some of the funding, and some of the organizational structure atrophied a bit during those, those decades. But now we're coming back because the threat has reemerged. The threat is now back in our face and we have to start reinvigorating the funding lines, the, the organizational structure, the capabilities, and we are moving now in a better direction than we have in the past, but we still have a long ways to go. So uh, it's a great question. Um, it is about the technology, it's about the funding, but what we need are options that will allow us to move forward. We need the affordable technologies. We need the capabilities that are gonna uh, allow ourselves to operate in these environments to provide that denial uh, type of deterrence. So um, the challenges are, are vast, but I think a lot of it is, is not due to lack of interest, it's just due to the kind of fight that we've been in for so long. Now we're, we're evolving back to where we need to be to face our current threat in accordance with the National Defense Strategy. Uh, let's see. The The Chem Biodefense Program struggles to maintain funding. How does the Air Force as a service view the need to maintain a robust program? So I, again, I think it, it comes back to what I just said. We're now, we're in a different uh, place now. We're starting to move towards a, I think, an attitude of importance of this threat and what it really brings. Just the fact that it's mentioned in our national defense strategy, I think, is a, is a huge signal to all of us that the world has changed, the strategic environment has changed, and we have to change with it. We have to adapt to this new environment, and it's going to take time and effort. So um, I, I, I wish I could say that we have to be patient, but we can't be patient. Our, our people in the field uh, don't deserve patience. They, they deserve the capability that they need. So. Uh, the reason that I'm standing here today is because our chief of staff and our secretary do understand the importance of this and they have tasked me as uh, the Air Force lead for our programs um, to try to be out front on this and to advocate. So that's the position that we're in now and we will keep pushing it. I'll tell you though, funding is always an issue. And even if something is a, a high priority, that doesn't mean that it gets all the money that it needs. So we'll continue to push, continue to advocate, but we do have a ways to go. As the end user of products being developed by JPAO, CBRND, is your organization appropriately engaged to ensure delivered capabilities best meet your needs? Well, I, I think we are. Uh, we have a great relationship with our partners, not only throughout the department, but, uh, but in industry. But again, there are, there are more tentacles that we have to get out there. And this is a part of it, is reaching out to our industry partners and other government partners who we may not have connected with for, for some time. But we continue to make efforts to ensure that we are appropriately connected and that we are articulating what our requirements are, either generally or very specifically. So um, I would say right now we're probably not as well connected as we need to be, but we're moving in the right direction. And again, people like Mr. Bryce, who uh, you know he and I have, have sat down and talked several times about the things that we need to do and, and the direction that we need to go, we need more of that. We need more of our industry partners engaging and being here in a forum like this to try to understand what our needs are, what our strategy and our con-ops are. So uh, there's a lot more work to do here, but I think that we're moving in the right direction and we'll continue to move in the right direction. What keeps you awake at night? So I have a 17-year-old son and he is a monster. I don't know what to do about them. So if you have any ideas, that is the biggest threat in my life right now. So I'm just trying to survive that. I have a con op in place, but it's not working so far. So that's the first thing. Um, honestly, um, the thing that keeps me up the most at night is the, the fact, and I mentioned this in, in my talk, 
The fact that our adversaries are willing to blur the lines now between conventional and nuclear warfare. And it's not just conventional and nuclear, but it's to blur the lines across any type of warfare that, that may not be uh, conventional, that is not conventional. So what do I mean by this? Um, in the past, we have looked at, let's just, let's just take nuclear for example, we have looked at nuclear warfare in almost a stovepipe. It's a strategic fight. We have our, our ICBMs, our SLBMs, our strategic bombers. They are there for deterrence. They are, our nuclear weapons are there um, in, in case of the worst day in American history, in, in the worst day in world history, if they need to be used. Our adversaries, however, don't see the use of nuclear weapons in that way. If you look at the Russian doctrine and uh, the Gerasimov model, well, Gerasimov is the, is the chad, the, the chief of their defense, of the Russian defense, and his model and their spectrum of conflict during a conventional fight, using a nuclear weapon, a non-strategic nuclear weapon on the battlefield is just a course of action. It is something that they will do if need be to gain or to achieve their national security objectives. And um, for us, we have not uh, worked that into our doctrine. And what I fear is that if we did get in a conventional uh, fight in the European continent with Russia, if we had the success that we believe that we're gonna have conventionally, they would resort to the use of non-strategic nuclear weapons. We have not put the attention on that. We have not exercised it the way that I believe we need to exercise it. We don't have the doctrine, and I'm only speaking for the Air Force. Uh, we don't have the doctrine, and we don't have the concept to be able to respond if necessary, if that's the option that the president uh, determines uh, should be the response. We don't have the response uh, ability to uh, respond in kind. We also are lacking in the, in the ability to fight in, around, and through that environment, which is why we're here today. We have to be able to operate in that environment if we're gonna be able to achieve our objectives. But I wanna make one thing clear. The reason that we need to be able to do this is not to lower the threshold of nuclear weapons. It is to deter our adversaries from using those weapons in the battlefield. We have to have a credible deterrence we have to have the options and the, the means to respond as necessary to our adversaries if we're gonna have any chance to deter the use of these devastating weapons. So that blurring of the lines, which we've always thought of as uh, you know, a, a place that we wouldn't go, I believe the adversary is taking us uh, to a place where we need to consider this. We need to have the doctrine, the capability, the concepts of operations to uh, deter and if necessary to achieve our objectives in that type of an environment. So that's what keeps me up at night the most and and partially because I just came from the European theater, I was the third Air Force commander and every time we ran an exercise, as we exercised the conventional fight, as soon as a nuclear event was introduced into that uh, scenario, it was pause X time, it was over to STRATCOM, it was, we don't fight the nuclear fight because we will not achieve the objectives that we're after. Those days are over. And I think that our department, and if you read the National Defense Strategy or the Nuclear Posture Review, OSD and the Joint Staff are directing us to be able to operate in that environment if necessary. But, but I want to make it clear one more time that our aim is not to lower the threshold of the use of these weapons. Our aim is to deter our adversary from using them, and then, if necessary, to achieve our objectives and the president's objectives, if necessary. So that's what keeps me up at night right now from, from my world and the things that I have to deal with. Thank you. I guess that means I'm finished. So uh, once again, uh, I appreciate the time uh, today to spend with you. But I, I want to reiterate, I appreciate what you do uh, as far as our government partners go, our industry partners go, and certainly our DOD partners for what you do for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines every day. They have to have these capabilities if they're going to be able to win our nation's war and deter those wars as a first, uh, as a first option. So thanks for letting me talk to you.